Welcome back to Bad Things in History. Today, I am interviewing Matthew Kearns, author of Texas Jack, America's First Cowboy Star. Going to find out a little bit about the process of writing the book, why we haven't heard of Texas Jack, and why you should read this book. Matthew, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I'm uh, mostly my day job is web development uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, but a lifelong fan of, of uh, American history. I grew up taking long trips with my family across the western part of America in the spring. My mom was a teacher, which made that easy. Um, we went to the southwest in the, in the spring and then into Wyoming, Montana in the summer. And, you know, you, you go through these little towns and visit their, uh, you know, regional history museums. And you kind of can't help but, but, but catch that bug. So uh, that's, that's what happened to me, at least. Uh, started an interest in, in history that continues to this day. And what sparked the investigation into this particular figure? And like, what made you think, you know what, I, I should write a book about this guy. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't set out to write a book about Texas Jack. My initial plan was I was going to uh, write a novel about the time that uh, there was a season in between 1873 and 1874 when Texas Jack was on stage doing a dramatic tour, uh, an acting tour with Buffalo Bill Cody and Wild Bill Hickok. And I thought, you know, these three guys uh, are, or at least Wild Bill is still widely remembered. Buffalo Bill uh, is still pretty widely remembered. Um, that these guys, you know, were, were the real deal out West. They were, you know, legendary kind of uh, badasses. Um, and yet here they were, you know, sitting on a stage in Broadway or in Boston or in Washington, D.C., you know, performing before an audience. And I thought, I bet that would make a real fun story. And because I'm a horrible procrastinator, I started looking up, uh, you know, resources about these guys. I read a book on Wild Bill by an author named Joe Rosa. I read a couple books on Buffalo Bill. Uh, and when it came time to look for uh, Texas Jack, I discovered that there was really only one book that had ever been written by him. It was released in the mid 50s and kind of what I call a, a hagiography. You know, it was, it was saint worship of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this wild Western figure. But that really, even looking at his Wikipedia page, there wasn't a whole lot of information out there. And, uh, and in reading that book, it kind of it seemed like it went you know, this guy did all this stuff that's, you know, should be widely well known. Uh, and then for a couple of years, he probably acted, maybe, I don't know. And then he died. And I was like, well, there's got to be more to it than that. And so I started doing research for this, you know, in my head, this novel. Uh, and as I researched, I realized, you know, somebody really ought to tell this guy's story. And then I thought, well, hey, I'm already trying to write something. Why don't I tell that story? Uh, and that's what happened. It turns out after I did all that, that somebody had actually written a book that was exactly what, what I had intended. It was a guy named Johnny Boggs, who's the most uh, uh, awarded Western writer of this generation. He's essentially the Louis L'Amour of, of our time, uh, has won numerous Spur Awards and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm glad I didn't try to step on his coattails in the end. All right. So for people who are... Uh, for people who are unfamiliar with Texas Jack or are incidentally familiar, is there one choice anecdote, uh, one incident that stands out or some feature that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a, a couple but to me, you know, and just in terms of anecdotes, there was a Texas Jack would would spend his time acting in the East during that, that dramatic season. Remember, this is before air conditioned theaters. So during the summer, you were essentially out of a job if you were an actor because nobody wanted to go sit in a hot theater with 100 other people closed in next to them. So he would act during the acting season. Then during the West, he'd go during the summer, he'd go back West uh, and, and take uh, usually European aristocrats on these tours through the new Yellowstone Park or, or these kind of things. Well, he goes out to do that um, with a guy named Sir John Ray Reed of England, um, who's a baronet of some sort. Uh, and they, they decide they're going to meet up in a little town called Rollins, uh, Wyoming. Uh, 
Uh, it just so happens that this was uh, the year of a total uh, solar eclipse. And so all these scientists had decided that the best place in America to view the solar eclipse was in Rollins, Wyoming. It was right on the rail line. You could get there relatively easy, and it was going to be directly in the path of this solar eclipse. And one of those scientists was uh, young Thomas Edison. Now, Edison had invented this uh, device he called a, a tassimeter, which was supposed to measure the variations in the heat of the sun's corona during the solar eclipse. Very technical stuff. Um, so Edison's in a hotel room with a, a editor for a New York newspaper. When in the middle of the night, one night, there's a banging on their door and Edison's scared to death because he's heard there's desperados in the area. You know, people have scared him on this train trip out to Wyoming. So he cautiously gets out of bed and answers the door and and there stands uh, Texas Jack and buckskins and all of his Western paraphernalia, a big Bowie knife sticking out of his belt, revolver on his hip. And uh, Texas Jack says, hey, I've heard about this Thomas Edison guy, and I really want to meet, meet him. And Edison says, you know, that's me, but I'm, I'm asleep, and can, can, we, can we talk in the morning? And Jack says, look, don't you know who I am? I'm the guy that taught Doc Carver how to shoot. Doc Carver's a famous rifle shot at the time. Uh, I'm the baddest pistolier west of the Mississippi. And to prove his point, he whips his uh, revolver out of his belt, points it out past Edison's head, out the window, and shoots, hitting a weather vane on the train depot down the street and causing it to spin around. And he you know, <laughs> flips his uh, revolver, puts it back in his belt, and says, and that's who I am, and walks out. Well, Edison has no idea what the hell just happened. So the next morning he goes downstairs and, you know, tells somebody at the hotel what happened. And they say, oh, my God, that was that was Texas Jack. You know, you got to meet Texas Jack. And so now he's decided, OK, well, now that this guy's not a, a bandit, not somebody I should be scared of, I really want to meet him. Uh, but by this point, Texas Jack has already taken his group and headed out into the woods. Uh, and so Edison never really gets a chance to meet him, though he does discuss this. Uh, later with Buffalo Bill, uh, when he filmed some of the earliest movies using Buffalo Bill's Wild West uh, Native American uh, Sioux delegation to film movies at Black Edison in New Jersey. Yeah, and uh, and yet we've we've all heard of Thomas Edison. <laughs> yeah, the Wizard of Menlo Park is remembered, but uh, America's first cowboy, not so much. I say first cowboy because. You know, there were cowboys and, and Texas Jack had been a real life cowboy. He had after the Civil War, he was a, a scout, a cavalry scout for the uh, uh, Jeb Stewart, who was probably the Confederacy's uh, at least most well-known cavalry general. Uh, so he did that. And then at the end of the Civil War, he, he basically decided, you know, plantation life doesn't mean anything anymore. And he takes off for uh, Texas to become a, a cowboy. Uh, and he does that for really about five years after the Civil War before he ends up in North Platte. Uh, but he had been a real cowboy. And when he became famous, um, you know, it was alongside guys like Buffalo Bill, who was a, a buffalo hunter and, a, and an army scout, and Wild Bill, who was a lawman and a gunslinger. You know, but Texas Jack was the only actual cowboy of the group. And, uh, you know, it, to me, one of the things that I thought when we were when I was looking into this book was, you know, all of our Westerns are associated with cowboys. You know, you, you see a Stetson, you think it's a cowboy hat. Mm -hmm. You know, you see a Western movie, it's a cowboy movie. Even when the characters aren't wrangling cattle. Uh, and even when the guy wearing the Stetson is a police officer or a country music star, it's a cowboy hat. It's not a lawman hat or a buffalo hunter hat. And so what I thought was, well, how is it that we've forgotten about the actual cowboy who popularized all these things? You know, why... Why don't we remember this guy? We remember his buddies and his co-stars. And, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe his, his story was just boring, but it turned out to be pretty fascinating. He did a lot of stuff and was the first in a lot of ways. Um, so why, why don't we know more about Texas Jack? What, what did happen? The, the short story is that Texas Jack died very young and it wasn't in a gunfight. Um, you know, Wild Bill was assassinated in Deadwood in 1876 um and pretty well remembered i mean we've got shows like deadwood that uh you know to some degree of historic accuracy remind us of of who wild bill hickok was uh, buffalo bill lived into his uh, late 70s and by the time he died was the most famous man in, in the world definitely the most famous american uh you know he had entertained uh 
in front of, you know, in both in America and in Europe, in front of the Pope, in front of Queen Victoria, in front of kings and, and uh, rulers of various, uh, you know, nations in, in Europe, uh, and in front of tens of thousands of Americans who essentially took everything he presented as historical fact. Um, but Texas Jag died at the age of 33 in Leadville, Colorado, um, of a combination of uh, mostly pneumonia uh, on top of tuberculosis. Um, and so it became a little easier to forget him. He died in 1880. Um, and so it was just before the time of, uh, I think that, that if, if you look at American history, Western American history, you've got a period of time where the heroes are the good guys, Wild Bill, Buffalo Bill, uh, Texas Jack to some extent. And then that transitions to, um, you know, Wyatt Earp, who's kind of riding this line between being a lawman on the one hand, but having an unsavory past on the other. And then into guys like Jesse James and Billy the Kid, who were outlaws. You know, the, the veneration arc goes from hero to uh, villain pretty quick uh, in the American West. And Texas Jack was just kind of uh, at the wrong time. Now, the, the interesting thing to me was that he was pretty widely remembered early on, even after his death. People were referring to Stetsons as Texas Jack hats and revolvers as a Texas Jack gun, mm -hmm. uh, really up until uh, the Buffalo Bills Wild West show replaces Texas Jack, the individual cowboy, with a whole cadre of cowboys, guys like uh, Buck Taylor and, and uh, people like that that were part of Buffalo Bills cast. Okay, so I can see how there might have been some challenges in doing the essential research to produce this book. Uh, do any of the particular challenges kind of stand out or any particular kind of eureka, I found it kind of moments? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, you know, I think that if you're, if you're doing a, a biography, you refer back to the biographies that are already written. And the one that was written about Texas Jack, which again, was, was a pretty good for its time biography. The guy that wrote it, Herschel Logan, uh, did a pretty good job with what he had available at the time. Um, I have a, available a whole, um, range of digital archives and newspapers that have been digitized and presented to me that I can search easily. So it's way easier, I think, to write this kind of biography now. But in looking at, at his book, there's a lot of information that was taken directly from what you call dime novels, um, which dime novels were basically like what became comic books, and they were the first real accessible literature. And Texas Jack and Buffalo Bill and Wild Bill, to a certain extent, were already the stars of these kind of uh, stories, even when they were still alive. Uh, there was a, the first Buffalo Bill book came out in 1869. The first Texas Jack was uh, early 1873 while he was on tour. Um, you know, so these guys were already folk heroes in their own lifetime. So separating fact from fiction becomes problematic because so much fiction was presented as fact uh, in these kinds of stories. And in some of the, uh, you know, what uh, was going on in their lives was mirrored by these things, not because those were accurate, but because they were taking these kernels of truth and then just blowing them up into larger than life stories. Um, so, yeah, trying to get a uh, look at, at what was available and decide, you know, what's probably total fiction uh, could sometimes be problematic. Uh, initially, I thought it was going to be a problem just to find enough information and then at the end, I realized I had found so much information that I was never going to be able to squeeze it down into one book uh, if I didn't do some real strong editing. Okay. Well, uh, what's something that Texas Jack would want us to remember him for that you think is at least marginally true? Um, the thing that he would probably be the most proud of uh, outside of his, his marriage, he married uh, a woman who was an Italian ballerina who at the time was the most famous dancer in the world. She was trained at La Scala in, in uh, Italy and came over to America only after a, a, a career at Her Majesty's Theater in London and across the, con the European continent and came to America uh, at great expense on the fastest ship that was then making a crossing of the Atlantic. Uh, and he was very proud of, of, you know, of that, of, of his wife, of his relationship. Besides that, I think the thing that he's has been forgotten that he'd be most proud of is that he was one of the first people to lead parties into Yellowstone National Park when nobody really knew what was there. There were no roads. 
they knew there were some geysers there and they knew there was a lake and a waterfall. And uh, they knew that uh, there wasn't a whole lot of threat of, uh, of hostile uh, tribes uh, being in the area, but uh, there were a lot of bear and there were a lot of uh, danger really in the park. And so he went in, I think three different times into Yellowstone park leading groups of people. The first one was written up uh, by his guest at the time, the Earl of Dunraven. Uh, and it was really one of the big reasons that was 1874. One of the big reasons that Europeans started coming over to America to go see Yellowstone. Uh, and of course he, this book mentions Texas Jack, but he, he's more of an anecdote because he's, he's just the guide, right? He's, but Jack went back and did it again and again. And at one point, went in a way that no one else had ever gone and said in newspapers, you know, I hope that I will be remembered for Texas Jack's new road into the, the Yellowstone park, which of course he's not. Um, but you know, he was, he was, uh, very real about, you know, going East and presenting himself as a hero on the stages, but then not shying away from doing heroic actions when he was out West, uh, in 1877, uh, the Nez Perce tribe was escaping uh, from the from the army, and they trekked through Yellowstone Park while Texas Jack was there, and they got into a uh, uh, an altercation with some of the um, uh, the tourists that were in the park at the time. Well, Texas Jack kind of came to the rescue, according to some of these people that had been uh, uh, assaulted. Uh, at least, as you know, that was their understanding. The Nez Perce didn't view it as an assault. They were trying to get away. But these, these tourists that, that viewed themselves as assaulted uh, said that, you know, they couldn't have made it out without Texas Jack. Uh, well, then another guy who was trying to be a Wild West guide at the time went to the uh, Sioux City Journal and told them that Texas Jack was a coward and he hadn't actually done any of the stuff that he said, causing Texas Jack to respond by walking into the offices of the New York Sun, throwing down a, a, a yesterday's paper where they had reprinted this article and telling them, you know, this is a bunch of bullshit and we're going to get it right. Uh, and he could do that because he had that kind of cachet and fame, you know, to be able to have a whole story of his uh, answering to his uh, supposed cowardice in a major uh, New York newspaper, um, which says something about kind of uh, how famous he was then. And if someone comes at you like that and they are actually legitimate, not some coward, but actually someone who, you know, has has a spine and has a gun. How are you going to resolve that conversation? Sometimes right. an apology is in order. So, yeah, and and and, and uh, you know, Texas Jack wasn't uh, adverse to you know going to a newspaper and telling them telling them that they had said something they shouldn't have. Uh, there was a at n newspapers back back at that point were full of just lies. Uh, they had a lot of good information, but there were sometimes they just reprinted something because it sounded like something somebody would read. Uh, there was a, an article that got printed uh, at one point that said that Buffalo, this is when Buffalo Bill and Texas Jack were still touring together, uh, that Buffalo Bill had actually killed Texas Jack. They'd gotten into an argument and, uh, you know, it had come to, to blows and then uh, Cody had shot Omohundro. Well, that wasn't, wasn't true at all, but newspapers believed it because Bill Cody had missed a couple of shows in a row. Now, how they could believe that when Texas Jack was at those shows, who the hell knows. But what came of this was that the reason Buffalo Bill had missed these shows is because his son had contracted scarlet fever and had died at a very young age. And Buffalo Bill had only just made it home from a show they were doing before this happened. And so Texas Jack wrote to dozens of national newspapers, you know, demanding an apology for his friend that they had accused him of something he hadn't done while at the same time, not providing, uh, you know, care at a time when, when Buffalo Bill would have needed it the most. So he was, he was very adamant about setting things straight. And, I, and he was that way his whole life. There's a, a story uh, just before he dies that he witnessed uh, these young men hanging out at a train station in Leadville, Colorado, um, he'd witnessed them uh, demeaning uh, a young girl who had just got off the train and that he, he interceded and basically made this one fella uh, get down on his hands and knees and kiss the upturned soles of this girl's feet to apologize for having ever said something unkind in public. 
to a young lady. So that was kind of the guy he was. I mean, you know, it, it, it fits because so many of our cowboy tropes are about, you know, that kind of uh, justice seeker. Um, but that sometimes that was actually true. Of course, now we find ourselves, you know, a hundred some odd years later. And the world has changed. Culture and society have uh, evolved for better and for worse. And uh, so I'm kind of curious, during research for this book, can you recall offhand any moments in which you thought, this incident right here, that would not fly today? Oh, sure. There's, uh, you know, there's stories of kind of uh, casual um, violence that, you know, you think, and, and I say this, it's funny, the Wild West wasn't nearly as violent as it's portrayed in movies and TV shows. Uh, I live in Tennessee, where the state just passed a law that says anybody can carry a gun concealed or otherwise, anywhere they go with no permit. You couldn't have done that in Tombstone in 1882. You know, the Wild West was, was a lot more kind of uh, um, law abiding in some ways than, uh, than current society. But I say that to say that, yeah, there's a, there was a, an incident where um, Wild, this was when Wild Bill was with, uh, was with him. And Wild Bill only toured with him for part of one dramatic season before deciding that acting really wasn't for him. Uh, and they had gotten to this town, I think it was Titusville, Pennsylvania. And uh, had the, this was one of those towns where the theater had a hotel connected to it. And the, the uh, advance agent told him, you know, there's some guys in this town that are talking about, uh, they, want, they want to prove that they're tougher than the trio of men, you know, Texas Jack, Buffalo Bill, Wild Bill, that these guys are, are tougher than you are. So what we want you to do is let's just avoid this altogether and, uh, you know, stick to the hotel. You can get over to the theater without having to leave. You don't have to go anywhere. And they all agreed to this. But Wild Bill decided that uh, he wanted to go and, and have a beer and play some pool or billiards at the time. Uh, and so he went to go do that. And those guys happened to be out waiting for him out in front of the, the theater. Uh, and so they came in, they saw him walk into the, the billiards room and they came in after him and they thought Wild Bill was Buffalo Bill, long haired guy, Western dude in a Western outfit. Uh, and so they said, hey, hey, what, uh, Buffalo Bill. And he said, you got the wrong guy. They said, no, we know who you are, Buffalo Bill. You know, we're here to prove. And before they could get it out, he picked up a chair, smashed one guy, punched the next over the bar, picked up a guy, threw him outside, and in short order had cleared six guys that were coming after him from the bar and went back to playing. Well, pretty quick word gets back to Texas Jack and Buffalo Bill, what's going on down at the billiards hall, and they rush down uh, and say, what, you know, we agreed that we were going to avoid this kind of stuff, man. We're, you know. Uh, and, uh, he said, well, I, you know, I planned on avoiding trouble, but trouble found my trail and I did what I had to do now for them that would, it ends up being good advertising. You know, if in a city, uh, everybody looks like, uh, at you, like, oh my God, you know, these guys aren't just acting. They're the real deal. Uh, but yeah, at the, at the time that seemed fine. It wouldn't fly now. Another thing that wouldn't fly is that occasionally to prove how good they were at, uh, at their, their weaponry, They'd go outside and Buffalo Bill would hold up a, you know, a silver dollar and walk down to the corner and Texas Jack would hold up his revolver and walk to the far corner and then shoot the coin out of Buffalo Bill's hand in front of a bunch of, you know, children that had gathered to prove that, you know, they could do that kind of thing. And then they'd reverse it and Buffalo Bill would shoot a coin out of Texas Jack's hand. And then those coins with holes in them became souvenirs for all these, you know, whatever kid happened to, to get to it quick enough. Well, you, can you imagine, you know, somebody going out and shooting anything in the street uh, in any major eastern city at this point? That wouldn't fly. Uh, so, you know, it was it was a different time uh, and they were men of their time. So they were, you know, I don't think that. Uh, and, and that's that's not even to mention getting into altercations with Native American tribes on the plains, which which they did. Um, and that's actually kind of how I start my book is. When I was a kid, you know, we grew up playing cowboys and Indians. But if you if you look into history, most of the time, groups of cowboys and Native American tribes did not get into altercations. By the time of, of the cowboy era after the Civil War, most of the tribes had either been decimated by disease or relegated to reservations in some way. Um, and so they weren't, uh, it just wasn't happening, you know, those kind of altercations. Uh, 
Uh, but in 1872, Buffalo Bill and Texas Jack rode out of Fort McPherson, Nebraska, in pursuit of some ho horse thieves of the Minneconju Sioux branch um, of the tribe. And uh, they got into a fight with them and, and they each, uh, you know, shot and killed uh, a tribesman. And uh, it doesn't really get to this, but I can guarantee you because of the time and place that they both scalped those guys. It was just what was happening and they would have been scalped had they lost that fight. So, you know, I think as a historian, it's just my job to report, not necessarily to judge um, though, certainly by today's standards, you know, it was, it was brutal and savage on both sides of, of those conflicts. So now that you have kind of finished the work, or you, you picked a spot at which you said, okay, this is going to have to be the book. <laughs> right. Now that you've, you've kind of done that, what's something that you would like to have included that we'll just have to wait for the sequel? <laughs> you know, it's funny because what I, what I decided at some point was that anything that I thought was interesting, um, let, me, let me start this from another place. I, I wrote this book as, a, as an author that had not been published anywhere. And it's, you know, nobody knows, uh, as we're discussing, Texas Jack isn't a famous figure. If you go out and you write a new book about Jesse James or Billy the Kid, somebody's going to be interested. If you write a book about a guy that most people have forgotten about or never heard of in the first place, uh, it's harder to get traction. So what I decided was that I needed to build an audience for this book uh, for way before it was ever going to be released. So anything that I found that, that, was interesting, but not uh, relevant enough that it was actually going to be in the, the end book. I just write a little blog post about it and then put it on uh, mm. all the social media sites. So my website uh, has a ton of, of anecdotes that, you know, are interesting, but sometimes they were not factual and sometimes they were uh, interesting, but not relevant enough to be included. Um, so I've probably written as much of that as there is in the book. Okay. Um, you know, so I, I kind of don't, I don't know, maybe that's cheating. I didn't really have to, uh, to worry about the things I was leaving out quite as much as I would have other ones. And you also have a YouTube channel, uh, uh, generally about the subject, maybe promoting the book, you know, getting across some of the themes, right. uh, making it accessible to people who are more interested in watching videos than in reading that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, you end up with, with a bunch of pictures. I mean, I've got hundreds of pictures of Buffalo Bill that I've, that I've found. And some of them are very interesting and unique. And some of them are pretty standard publicity shots. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you, you can't, you can put maybe 20, 25 pictures in a, in a book and in a book about Texas Jack, they're going to be pictures of him or that are, you know, incredibly relevant, not a picture of Buffalo Bill 10 years after he died, you know? So um, yeah, it was, it, it's an excuse to kind of share all of the research, you know, that the otherwise would just be in a box, uh, you know, in my closet somewhere. All right. And, uh, Texas Jack, proud, accomplished, seems to have lived kind of an interesting, if somewhat too brief life. I'm personally kind of interested in the like weird juxtaposition between cowboy life and acting. How do you think like that happened? Did you kind of uncover anything like the development of this whole cowboys on stage enterprise? Yeah. So, so it, it almost happens uh, by accident. I mean, I think that you'd, you'd had a fascination in America with uh, the Western frontier, wherever that was. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, early on that's uh, leather stocking tails kind of stuff. It's, it's, you know, the Western edge of New York is just as mysterious as, you know, Wyoming, which is nothing at the time. Uh, and that moves into, uh, you know, Davy Crockett in Tennessee and, and uh, that kind of thing. And as the frontier moves West, um, you get different levels of interest. Early on with Davy Crockett, there was, there was a play uh, about a character named Nimrod Shepard, who was just, uh, I, th I think it was Nimrod Shepard, Nimrod Shepard or Nimrod Wildfire or something like that. Uh, who is a, a it, it's essentially Davy Crockett and they made a stage play of it and Crockett comes to see the show. And of course people know, okay, the real guy's here and they all applaud and he stands up and waves. This is when Crockett is a, a congressman uh, in DC. 
Um, and so there had been a fascination with, with Western life and frontier life and border stories uh, for a while. Um, when it moves into what we call the Western, uh, to me, the first one of those is the one that Buffalo Bill and Texas Jack do. And that's in December of 1872, a show called The Scouts of the Prairie, um, which is written by and co-starring uh, the author, a guy named Ned Buntline, who is the second most read author of the time behind Mark Twain, and who is just a notorious kind of uh, scoundrel is the, the, nicest, the nicest term. He had, uh, he had incited riots in New York at the Astor Place Opera House and in St. Louis over nativism. Uh, he was a, a big proponent of the Know Nothing Party uh, or the Native American Party, as they called themselves. And he had led a fascinating life already. Uh, but his main job and source of income was as a writer. So he had been writing these books. He, he came out West on a temperance lecture uh, to California in 1869. And on the way back, stopped in Nebraska and met these guys, Texas Jack and Buffalo Bill, and started writing stories of them pretty much immediately. Um, and those were kind of uh, frontier stories. When it becomes the Western is when they launch their, uh, their stage show. Uh, and of course, the stage show is... is uh, not something that they were prepared for. They, uh, they agreed to it, but they weren't actors and they weren't qualified to act, as many critics point out, uh, especially early on. But audiences don't seem to care because like now we have reality stars and we have this concept of, you know, viewing a, a, a real person or at least a stylized presentation of the real person. But that, you know, they kind of created that in this, in this Western. They starred as Buffalo Bill and Texas Jack. So the characters were the same as the men and the audiences were meant to believe that this is exactly what these guys were doing right before they walked into this theater. Um, you know, and so that kind of creates the modern Western uh, and, and it eventually it incorporates aspects of their real lives like Cowboys and Indians comes from those altercations that these two guys have on the Nebraska Prairie. Uh, high noon shootouts, which again are not a historical fact, are based on a real shooting between Wild Bill Hickok and Dave Tutt in Springfield, Missouri. Um, you know, so there are all these incidents where like real life uh, is kind of goes through the refiner's fire of drama and becomes uh, a trope, you know, shootout at high noon or cowboys and Indians or, you know, the brave cowboy lassos the bad guys. Cowboys didn't lasso people. That's that's not what lassos are for. But on stage, Texas Jack would show off, you know, all of his lasso tricks, and then he'd lasso a couple of the bad guys and, you know, physically pick them up and drag them off stage. And that got a huge response. So, of course, it became part of the Western legend and incorporated into, you know, God knows how many TV shows and Louis L'Amour books and uh, movies since. Uh, it's... Interesting to me on a certain level, some of the things you're mentioning, just from my own personal experience, I remember as a small child in Texas, going through the process of a kind of general enculturation that happens, you know, wherever you happen to be, you grow up and you kind of pick up the flavor of the area where you're in. And so I remember by the age of like four and five, I had ridden a horse. I had learned how to crack a bull whip, some of those essential skills that are actually still useful, but maybe not in, you know, downtown Dallas, as much as actually on the farm where, you know, the little kids are giving milk to the baby cows, which is an interesting challenge in itself. And so you're kind of reminding me of this stuff. Can you think of maybe as people think about buying this book and reading this book, what are some of the sorts of people who might like it or perhaps some of the kind of overlapping interests that you think might be appealed to? Sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, the most obvious is if you're into Western history and, and, and the history of kind of the settling of the American frontier, you know, yeah, that's for you. But to me, and, and, and I'm as interested in that as the next guy. But to me, what I really liked about this, this guy as I got into it was just the pop culture ramifications of, of one forgotten life. And that if you can, if you can get down to the root of, of looking through a cultural lens and the lens of the time he lived in, of just seeing how impactful he could be, not because everybody's, you know, 
going around calling themselves Texas Jack, but because so much of our of our pop culture view of history, our tropic view of the cowboy, um, is fictional. And because it's fictional, it's based on on a fiction. And he's the fiction it's based on because for him, even though he was had been a cowboy, he was also an Indian scout. And so the the cowboy chasing down Indians made sense. And on stage, after he and Buffalo Bill split up, you know, he starred alongside a guy named uh, Donald McKay, who was a, a, a half Cayuse uh, man who was a scout for the, the army in the Modoc War of 1873. You know, so Americans could really go see a cowboy and an Indian on stage together. And it made sense that that fiction would become kind of a stand in for the reality, which was in most cases pretty dull as far as cowboys went. You know, they were more like truck drivers than leather clad knights. They were making sure that a product is safely taken from point A to point B without any loss. You know, having as little action and as little excitement as possible between A and B made the most sense. Um, but the reason that we view cowboys that way is because of this guy. And so the pop culture aspects of it, you know, and, and early theater aspects of it to me were, were pretty interesting that, you know, vaudeville hadn't become a thing yet, but these guys would do, you know, set up these long tours by train going from city to city. And the way that there's actually a book uh, called Pioneers of Promotion, which is just about the innovation used in advertising for Buffalo Bill uh, and the Wild West show, because they had to create things that hadn't existed before. You know, they had to, to work about logistics of, okay, well, we got to get from this city to the next city, but we want everybody there to have seen the poster of the show and to, you know, have seen something in the newspaper about what's coming. So they had to invent, you know, this whole um, arm of advertising just because they were doing something that hadn't really been done. And so to me, there's a lot of kind of, uh, you know, history in there that isn't just, uh Western and not just even cowboy related, uh, but is, you know, more related to kind of uh, our own fiction of ourselves and how that became just a commonly accepted truth. All right. Well, Matt, it is a, an absolute pleasure meeting you and I'm yeah, really enjoying this conversation. Um, we will uh, link in the video description to your YouTube channel and, uh, a non-affiliate Amazon link so people can get that book. And uh, I hope people will read it and enjoy it. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on it myself. It's a fresh release, just came out a few days ago. And so I haven't yeah, even right. had a the chance to read it month. yet. Yeah. And so uh, I'm absolutely delighted to have this conversation. And uh, I hope things go well for you. Hope you sell a million copies. And uh, that can happen. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, thanks for contributing to bringing more history to light. Oh, yeah. Thanks it's, for doing what you do. I think that so much of, of kind of the way that you all view things and, and what you have shown uh, in, the, in the videos I've seen so far. And now I'm, now I'm a fan, so I, I keep watching. But uh, I just think that, you know, the, that perspective uh, is great of the things that maybe we shouldn't have forgotten and the things that we intentionally forget. Yeah. And uh, well, you can you can hear my uh, my Siamese bubs is telling me it's time for some treats, and so I will cut you loose. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we will see you on Bad Things in History very soon. Thank you.